In the last lecture, we were trying to assess uh, the different length scales of the different size eddies. So, before going to a formal assessment using the scaling relationship that we have established, maybe let us now lo look into uh, some visual uh, demonstrations of how these eddies might look like. So, just look into these, some of these are simulated flows, but just look into the rotating structures and uh, you will see that these rotating structures are having a wide range of length scales. So, if you see that they are really having a wide range of length scales and they fluctuate over a wide range of time scales. So, we will just go on uh, looking into some of these types of uh, visual demonstrations to figure out the roles played by the eddies. So, just see the roles played by the eddies which are not there in the laminar flow. So, these eddies are turbulent eddies. Maybe couple of more ones. So, this is a three dimensional visualization. So, all these have been generated by computer simulation. Uh, so, uh, you can see uh, visualize the structure of these eddies. So, we will just pass it a bit fast and uh, try to figure out. So, this if you want to see the eddies in different planes. So, you can see that the structure in eddy structure of the eddy is changing from one plane to the other. So, it clearly gives us an indication that there is nothing called a two dimensional turbulent flow. Turbulent flow is always three dimensional and unsteady fundamentally. So, that is the first understanding that we develop out of this. So, at all different sections and at all different planes, you see these different uh, characteristics of this rotating structures. And these rotating structures are continuously evolving with time. That is also one of the important things. So, you have not only a wide range of length scales, but a wide range of time scales. And we will try to have an estimate of these ranges of length scales and time scales. So, uh, the whole idea of this understanding was to have an appreciation that you may have wides of dif uh, wide range length scales of the eddies. And to quantify that, let us say that we are now interested to get a feel of the difference between the system length scale and the Kolmogorov length scale or the smallest eddy length scale. So, the system length scale or the largest eddy length scale uh, sometimes known as integral length scale. So, let us see that what is this. So, if let us say that L is of the order of 1 meter, this is an example. Just we are trying to take good numbers so that uh, we come up with e easy estimates. So, the system length scale say you have a 1 meter system length scale, the largest eddy is also of that length scale. Let us say that the Reynolds number is uh, in that is 10 to the power 4. So, then what will be eta? So, 1 meter into Reynolds number to the power minus 3 fourths. So, 1 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter. Right. So, if you make the Reynolds number larger and larger, the disparity between L and eta becomes more and more. 10,000 is not a very large Reynolds number, it is just like uh, moderately large. So, when you if you make the Reynolds number really very, very large, this disparity will be more and more and you have eddies at almost all intermediate length scales between these. So, that is what we say that the existence of multiple length scales or uh, not only multiple a wide range of length scales differing in order of magnitude by at least 1000, uh, if you see the order of magnitude difference. Similarly, if you look into the time scales and the velocity scales. So, the velocity scale in the smallest eddy. So, velocity scale in the smallest eddy, how do you estimate? The
the velocity scale is of the order of nu by eta from the Reynolds number scale equal to 1. So, the kinematic viscosity it is roughly like say 10 to the power minus 6 meter square per second for water nu by rho 10 to the power minus 3 divided by 10 to the power 3. And if you take eta as say 10 to the power minus 3 meter, then you come up with a V of the order of 10 to the power minus 3 meter per second. These are small velocities. And not only that, if you look into the system scale velocity that is quite large. So, the system scale velocity that is u naught that is governed by the system scale Reynolds number and that is quite large. The time scale, so the time scale for the system it is L by u naught or the large large eddy for the large eddy is of the order of L by u naught and for the small eddy that is the Kolmogorov time scale. So, this V is Kolmogorov velocity scale. So, if you consider the time scale for the small eddies that is sort of eta by V. So, it is possible to have an estimate of the time scales and the length scales and the velocity scales. The other important aspect of the large eddy and the small eddies or the distinctive aspect is that the large eddies have a sort of directionality or a directional preference because they are large and they have some uh, preferred directions over which they have their activity. On the other hand, smallest eddies have no directional preference and the distinction therefore is that the largest eddies are very much anisotropic. So, they do not have, uh, they do not have like uh, isotropy or a direction independence type of behavior. On the other hand, if you go to smallest eddies, they are virtually isotropic. So, they are, uh, it is not that they are actually isotropic, but they are approximately very, very much isotropic. So, the transition of paradigm from the largest eddy to smallest eddy is also in the form of a big anisotropy to a reasonably good state of isotropy. And that is possible because the eddies will tend to become more and more isotropic as and when they are able to dissipate. Uh, whatever energy is is being transferred to them through viscous effects because viscous effects sort of tries to e equilibrate it in all possible directions. So, uh, viscous effects are stronger and stronger for smaller and smaller eddies and that is why as you go towards smaller and smaller eddies, the dissipation effect makes it more and more isotropic or direction independent. Now, uh, we will try to understand Another important thing that see these eddies are having rotations and when they have rotations, they must have vorticities. So, we will try to see that how these vorticities evolve for these eddies. We will try to develop a sort of governing equation for vorticity and we will try to understand that qualitatively by understanding the relative uh, interaction between the large eddies and small eddies and so on. So, let us say that we, we start with uh, the vector form of the Navier-Stokes equation. So, let us say that we have rho So, this is like the momentum equation in a vector form which we derived. Now, what we are interested to do is to get expressions for vorticity out of that. So, we know that vorticity is the curl of the velocity vector. So, let us take curl of both sides of this equation so that we have a chance of coming up with the vorticity. So, just take curl of both sides. So, if you take the curl of both sides, then what happens? first term so curl is a is a vector operator 
with respect to the special gradient. So, with respect to time you may just take it inside outside without any problem. Then Now let us try to simplify this. So for simplifying this clearly we understand that this is equal to the vorticity vector, let us call it zeta. There is another term which we can of course this is also zeta, there is another term which we can clearly simplify, what is this? This is 0 like this is the curl of gradient of a scalar, so curl of gradient of a scalar by a vector identity this is 0. So we have now to concentrate on this term, so it is curl of, now let us write u dot del u, so what is this, this is by the vector identity, this one. Right. So, this just we have written the vector identity. So, when we have written this vector identity, so let us first consider the first term. So, this is like this is a scalar u square by 2 uh, or just u square. So, when you write So this is a dot product of a vector with a vector, right? So when you when you write this, one important thing that you are getting out of this is whatever it is, it is a scalar. So you have curl of gradient of a scalar. So the first term becomes zero. Therefore, this boils down to minus of curl of this one, because this is the vorticity vector. And this is as good as So the left hand side becomes what rho one of the terms that is this term we retain in the left hand side the other term we bring in the right hand side. So the right hand side becomes. So can you identify what is what is the term which is there in the square bracket in the left hand side? This is the capital DDT of zeta, the total derivative of zeta. So we can write the, so we have got a transport equation of vorticity by starting with the Navier-Stokes equation and uh, let us just write it in terms of the kinematic viscosity, if you divide both the sides by the density, then you have this one is equal to So you can clearly see 
that this is what if you have a vortex element that is an element within which there are elements of vorticities then this vortex element may have a change in vorticity. So, the total derivative is representing what? This is a change in vorticity of an element because of a combined effect of change in time and change in position in going to a different place where the velocity field is different. Therefore, it is subjected to a different velocity gradient at a new location and with respect to time also there has been a change the total effect is a combination. Yes. Sorry, 1 by rho. So, the total derivative of the vorticity is what? You have one term in the right hand side, this is uh, quite straightforward to understand, that is the second term. The second term represents what? It represents the viscous dissipation of vorticity, so to say. So, there is some total rate of change of vorticity, it is related to something which is viscous dissipation, but something else also which is not viscous dissipation and we will try to understand that what is this something else or what is the implication of this term and that we will do in a very simple and qualitative manner. So, when we do it in a simple and qualitative manner, <coughs> we will again go back to the picture of the large eddies and the small eddies. <coughs> so, when you have a large eddy, for a large eddy, the Reynolds number is large, right. So, for a large eddy, the inertia force is much, much greater than the viscous force. For smaller eddies, the viscous forces are also there. Now, if you just simply in a rough way model an eddy, you can say that a vortex element, the rate of change of angular momentum of a vortex element, let us say i omega, when we say the total rate of the rate of change, it is like we are writing the total derivative because the rate of change may be because of many things. So, this is as if we are tracking a fluid element which is going from one place to the other because of change in time and change in position combined effect is the some net rate of change of angular momentum and that must be equal to the viscous the torque due to viscous forces. So, here because whatever force what we are seeing uh, what we are seeing is a torque uh, is a is a viscous force that is what is a forcing parameter. So, this you can write as I d omega d t plus omega d i d t is equal to the viscous torque. I am just writing it symbolically. Therefore, d omega d t is equal to minus omega by i d i d t plus viscous torque by i ok. Let us consider the large eddies. So, what happens for the large eddies? Those are very special cases when the viscous effects are very, very negligible because for the large eddies the Reynolds number is very large. So, for the large eddies the angular momentum is conserved. Now, when the large eddies are extracting energy from the mean flow what is going to happen? Their angular velocity will increase. So, omega will increase, but if I omega has to be conserved then I should decrease. So, I should decrease means their sort of radial length scale should decrease and therefore, if they were more or less the, if the large eddies were more or less like this, uh, the small eddies uh, I mean the their subsequent transformation to preserve the angular momentum will be of a shape which is if, if you consider this as a radial dimension, this is R2 say this is R1. So, R1 will come down to a lower R2, but if it is the same large eddy the volume has to be conserved. So, if the radial length scale has decreased, the lateral length scale should increase and therefore, the 
vortex element or the eddy has got so called stretched. This is known as vortex stretching. So, vortex stretching vortex stretching is one should not create a uh, misunderstanding that vortex stretching is only for the largest eddy, it is not like that. But we are giving an example of a large eddy where a very large eddy where viscous effects are negligible just to give a clear uh, relationship between what is the change of the moment of inertia, how it is related to the angular velocity. So, if you have now eddies which are rotating at a higher speed, they must sacrifice it in terms of having a lower moment of inertia. So, that i into omega is conserved and when you have that, that means it is sort of stressed to have the same volume, but now with a lower ra radial scale. So, that the moment of inertia is now less. Now, what happens for a case when viscous effects are present qualitatively same, because if you see that when this viscous effects were not there, you see d omega dt. So, d omega dt is the rate of change of the angular velocity and you see that is related to minus of d i dt. So, one in increment is another decrement and now the viscous torque will also play an additional role. Now, if you come back to this equation, see there is a lot of similarity between this equation and this, this is a differential equation, this is a very qualitative, this is also like uh, some sort of differential equation, but not rigorously derived. So, it is just by putting terms qualitatively and what we see here is that if you consider the left hand side, see this is uh, the total derivative of vorticity, this is almost very closely related with the total derivative of the angular velocity, because the angular velocity is half of the vorticity vector. So, these two are related, the viscous terms these are related, therefore, whatever is this term and whatever is this term, these two must be carrying the same meaning. That means, so what does this term indicate? This term represents the effect of vortex stretching. With a larger omega, you have a decrement in i. Therefore, this term in the vorticity transport represents a vortex stretching. So, vortex stretching is one of the very important activities that is taking place in a turbulent flow structure and it can be shown that this effect is important or there only for a flow with a three dimensional structure and a turbulent flow has only a three dimensional structure. It on an average it might be two dimensional, one dimensional whatever, but fluctuations are there in all possible direction. So, even if the mean flow is 0 in a particular direction, but you still have fluctuations in all possible direction. So, the question is how we quantify these means and the fluctuations. So, the next thing where we will go to is the statistical description of turbulent flows. So, when we say statistical description, that means there is some uncertainty which we want to show, which we want to express by some sort of averaging or finding the standard deviation, these types of parameters. So, one of the most important uh, or most fundamental and sometimes considered to be the easiest statistical description is averaging. So, we, we are now going to uh, discuss about some concepts of averaging in a turbulent flow. So, to have a qualitative picture, let us say that you are plotting the velocity as a function of time. So, if you are having a turbulent flow, maybe you are having this type of a random fluctuation in velocity as a function of time. It might so happen that you are not interested about this randomness you are interested to see that how it is on an average, but the question is if you want to find out average over a given period of time, what is that time? So, 
the average over a given period of time, so if you want to find out say u average. So, u average is what? You must integrate u with respect to time over a time interval, say a time interval of say time equal to 0 to time equal to capital T, divide it by T and take some limit. Formally, it is written as limit capital T tends to infinity. What is the meaning of this infinity? That we have to understand. So, this this is a formal definition of something known as time average. So, time average at a given location. So, time average at a given location that means this u naught is a uh, this u is a function of a given position say x naught and this u what we are writing inside is a function of both position and time. So, u as a function of x naught and time. The time effect has got nullified by integration with respect to time. So, this is only at a fixed position. So, now this time scale, what is this time scale? See the turbulence fluctuations have very small time scale. So, you can see that over very sh short time it is having a very rapid fluctuation. So, if you want to average it out, you must take a time scale which is much larger than the characteristic time scales over which the turbulent fluctuations are there. So, that turbulent fluctuations are averaged out or smoothed out and that means that with respect to this turbulent fluctuations, this time scale is like infinity, very large. So, this infinity is not in a literal sense, this is with respect to the local fluc locally fluctuating uh, time scales, but this should also be much less than the system length scale, the system time scale. The system time scale says are from here to here there is some change. So, now if you consider this time scale as the entire system time scale, then you will not be able to capture the transiences in the average sense. So, that means you will lose all the information and come up with a single value if you come up with the, so if you average over the entire time. So, the time period over which you are averaging is very critical, it should not be too small so that still it is within the range of the individual turbulent fluctuations, but it should not be too large so that you can resolve the transiences on an average. So, it should be something in between, it should not be as large as the system time scale, but it should not be as small as the individual turbulent fluctuation time scale. So, if you now make a sort of this type of averaging and plot u bar, then it is possible say you get the u bar like this and u bar may be in this example u bar is not changing with time. So, this type of case where the actual thing is time dependent, but on a statistically average sense the average is not a function of time this is known as stationary turbulence or steady turbulence. Usually we call the use the term stationary turbulence because steady is a misnomer turbulent flow is never steady. So, uh, but the meaning is like stationary is like time independent. So, this means time independent average behavior, it does not mean time independent actual behavior, only on a statistically average sense this is uh, this is not a function of time, but it is also possible to have it a different way. Let us say that you have an average like this and on the top of that say you have fluctuations like this. So, the line which is drawn with a blue is an indicator that you may have a turbulent flow which may be having a time average which is not a constant, which is varying with time. So, the solid uh, line which is going through the middle is an indicator or maybe let us just mark it with a different color. So, if we mark it with this particular color. So, this example is a case where it is not a stationary turbulence. So, this is a stationary turbulence, but the other is not. So, after time averaging you may still get time dependence, but that time dependence is over a time scale which is important for the system and that is not uh, that is something we need to keep in mind. So, this is called as time averaging. Similarly, you may also go for a space averaging. 
So, what is space averaging? Very, very similar. So, space averaging is averaging with respect to space or position at a given instant of time. So, very similar just swap the space and the time variable. So, now what we are doing at a given time we are taking the data at different spatial locations and finding an finding an average out of that. In experiments we usually are not very careful about time averaging and space averaging, but in experiments whatever averaging we do intuitively is known as ensemble averaging. So, let us see what is an ensemble average. What is an ensemble? So, if you do a large number of experiments with identical condition, so that is called as an ensemble. So, let us say that we are doing an experiment where we want to find out the velocity variation as a function of time and position. So, what we do? So, let us say that we have a pipe at a given location. So, there could be many locations. So, let us say that this is one location. At this location, we want to measure velocity as a function of time. So, we are doing one experiment where we are doing it. Again, we are doing another experiment, then we are getting a reading at this point. These experiments are all done at identical condition, but because of the randomness, the output is not identical because there could be slight variations in the experimental conditions and those got amplified. That is like an instability that is there in a turbulence flow. So, therefore, if you repeat such experiments, for each experiment you will get some sort of data or information at your identified points at a given instant of time and you can make an average prediction out of all experiments. And that average prediction out of all experiments is known as ensemble average. You have to keep in mind that these experiments must be performed under identical conditions. So, identical conditions you are, but the irony is you are believing it is identical condition, but there is always a slight perturbation or slight difference from one condition to the other, which is making it deviated from the exactly identical condition. So, the when you have ensemble average, it means averaging, averaging from a large number of experiments conducted under identical conditions. Okay. So, when you say averaging from a large number of experiments under conducted under identical conditions, we will also try to understand the implications of this averaging and the relationships with time averaging and space averaging for certain special cases. We will come to those special cases subsequently. Now, when you have an average, you also have a deviation from the average in a statistical sense that is represented by the RMS or the standard deviation. So, now if you write say the x component of velocity as an example, say as u average plus u prime. So, this is the average. So, when we are saying this as average, we are not committing what sort of average. It could be time average, space average, ensemble average, whatever, but with respect to average there is always a fluctuation. So, this is average and this is fluctuation. In most of the textbooks, the average is written by an upper case and the fluctuation is written. Uh, or by a lower case or something like that, but uh, like when we write in the board it is very difficult to distinguish between the upper case and the lower case. So, we are going to use this uh, 
the prime for the fluctuation and the bar for the average. In some cases, for the average, this type of uh, breast symbol is also used. So, this is a typical symbol for ensemble average, but again, I mean, one may use any either this sort of symbol or the over bar, I mean, either is uh, fine as a notation for averaging. So, if you want to find out what is the RMS, so first of all, you want to find out that, so what is RMS? So, root mean square deviation. So, first is the deviation, so deviation from what? Deviation from the mean. So, deviation from the mean is u minus u bar that is u prime. So, you have to find out the summation of this and squares, basically squares of the individuals and the summations. And then, so you see, you sum it up, divide it by the number of data and that will give you the square of the standard deviation and or the variance and the square root of that is the standard deviation. So, basically you are making an averaging of this. So, all those expressions we are representing by this. So, basically summing up of this data over a number of data and dividing by the same number of data is averaging. But why we are using this symbol is because the averaging may not always be on a discrete data. It may be or it may be on a statistical sense with a probability distribution function. So, we do not know that whether it is it is on a discrete set of data that you are doing it or you are fitting the data with a probability function and then finding out an average with that probability function. So, we are not committing with any specific definition of averaging, but just, just marking it with this one. So, when you do that, it is like the mean square deviation and when you make a square root, it is the root mean square deviation. So, the RMS of u is like this one. Similarly, you will have RMS of V and RMS of W for the velocity components along the three directions. There is some important terminology called as isotropic turbulence. What is isotropic turbulence? Isotropic turbulence means that the turbulence statistics are independent of direction. That means the RMS values of the velocities should be direction independent. That means, whatever is RMS of u, same should be RMS of v and same should be RMS of w. So, that means, you must have So, this is directional independence of turbulent statistics. Why the directional independence of turbulent statistics is going to be important? Because it may be, it may enable us in simplifying certain considerations when we are mathematically modeling a turbulent flow. So, we have to keep in mind that when you consider the averaging. So, if you, if you consider the averaging of say u prime, what is this? Say you want to find out the average of u prime, let us say time average. So, what will you do? This one. Right? But what is its value? Let us say we want to find out what is the average of u. So, average of u is limit as okay, with the limit and other things we will write later on. So, u is u bar plus u prime. With whatever limit. So, the first term see u bar 
is like an average which is not varying with this time. So, the first term becomes u bar. So, u bar integral of dt from 0 to capital T by 0 by capital T. So, u bar into t by t that gets cancelled out. So, plus this one that means the fluctuation of this, this must be 0 average. So, average of the fluctuation is 0 that is why it is a fluctuation random fluctuation it is average over that time must be 0. But the average of u prime square or v prime square or w prime square is not 0. So, the average of product of the two fluctuations that will not be 0 that we have to keep in mind. Now, so we have uh, introduced a terminology of isotropic turbulence and similarly we may introduce a terminology of homogeneous turbulence. So, what is homogeneous turbulence? Just by the name it is clear that the turbulence statistics are independent of position. Just like isotropic is independent of direction. So, this is direction position independent turbulence statistics. Turbulence, it is better to say turbulence statistics. Now, let us consider a stationary turbulence. So, that is also another terminology and stationary turbulence means you have the mean is independent of time or the average value is independent of time that is stationary turbulence. So, for a stationary turbulence what we may say is that if you are doing a time averaging if you are doing a time averaging, then the time average value is what? The time average value, if you if you repeat a many number of experiments, then the time average value as is as good as ensemble averaging. That means, at a given point, if you record the data and average the data at different times. So, the doing the data at different times is as good as doing the identical experiment at different conditions. Because it the average should not vary with time for a stationary turbulence. So, for a stationary turbulence if you are doing the experiment at different time only you are allowing the random fluctuations to be there as a function of time average is independent of time and the random fluctuations are those which make one experiment different from the other at a point. Therefore, if you do identical experiments and if you get an average of that at a given location with respect to number of experiments that is as good as time averaging for a stationary turbulence. That means, for a stationary turbulence you have the time averaging same as ensemble averaging. So, stationary turbulence will have a conclusion that the time average equal to ensemble average. If you have a homogeneous turbulence. then Homogeneous turbulence is where you have the turbulence statistics position independent. So, when you have turbulence statistics position independent that means at a given time if you do the experiment at different positions. So, if you do the experiment at different positions then what happens? So, at a given time you are doing the experiment just at different positions 
but different positions have the same behavior in terms of the average. That means doing the experiment at a time at different positions is just like doing different simulated experiments at different positions. So that means for homogeneous turbulence you must have the space average equal to ensemble average because varying over space is just like having identical experiments in terms of the mean characteristics. The mean characteristics should not be function of position for homogeneous turbulence, only fluctuations are functions of position. So if you have a stationary plus homogeneous turbulence, then you must have time average equal to space average equal to ensemble average, right. So homogeneous plus stationary turbulence will imply that you must have the time average equal to space average equal to ensemble average and this is known as ergodic hypothesis. Okay. So we have looked into the averaging and the finding out the RMS of different quantities and of course one uh, may do certain other statistical operations using the features of turbulent flow and one of those important features that we will consider is by developing a correlation in the turbulent flow. So a correlation and correlation coefficient for turbulent flow. Let us say that you have a random variable capital X. So when you have a random variable, we say what is a random variable? The outcome of a random experiment which depends on chance. So if there is a variable which, which has its outcome dependent on chance or probability, so that is a random variable. Now if you have a random variable at a time say T1 and another random variable say Y at a time T2, then if you just make a product of these and find the average, it sort of represents the average correlation between the random variables X and Y at times T1 and T2. If X and Y are the same random variable, then it is called as a autocorrelation. So autocorrelation when you have X and Y same random variable. So what it basically tries to represent, so if you have the feature of a random variable at a particular time and if you have the feature of the same random variable at a different instant of time, you are trying to see that how these two features are correlated. That means say what is happening now and maybe say what is happening after 20 seconds or 10 seconds or 100 seconds, so if those outcomes are there. And if you make a product of those outcomes and average it over all, sort, all possible data sets, then what average information you get is that on an average how the events are correlated and if the same event is there, that means if the random variable X and Y are same, then how the outcome of the random experiment at time T1 is related to the outcome or correlated with the outcome of the random experiment at T2. If it is a stationary turbulence then it does not matter what is the origin of this T1. So you may have say X at T and say X at T plus an additional time tau. So this T is immaterial, the origin of this T is immaterial if it is a stationary turbulence. That means the turbulence statistics are not function of time. So then for stationary turbulence. 
for stationary case you are able to write the correlation in this way. Now, what is this random variable? The random variable that we are looking for here is mostly the velocity. So, let us say that we are looking for the velocity or maybe one of the velocity fluctuations. So, this is known as the auto correlation of u prime. So, when you have the auto correlation of u prime, uh, the important thing is that this may be normalized or this may be expressed in terms of a so called uh, non dimensional manner because it is like it is like velocity square. So, if you normalize it, the normalization is with respect to the mean square deviation. So, that means if you want to write it in terms of a coefficient, so this if you call as say if you give it a name say capital R which is a function of tau, then you may have small r which is again a function of tau which is capital R divided by maybe this one, this is known as auto correlation coefficient. So, if you have a auto correlation coefficient, uh, this is just like having a normalized way of writing the correlation coefficient and it may be shown that its magnitude is always between 0 to 1 by a Schwarz inequality which is commonly used in statistics. So, this will be normalized always between 0 to 1. Now, it is also possible to have a sort of Fourier transformation of the auto correlation coefficient into some frequency domain and that is possible like if you have say for example, if you consider a transformation like this. So, So, this is known as energy spectrum of the turbulence and we will see that why it is so. And with the inverse Fourier transform it is also possible to recover the R. So, So, when you have this one, so if you, sorry, this is minus and this is plus. Okay. Now, when you consider the special case of tau equal to 0, so if you consider tau equal to 0 and say you are, since it is stationary turbulence, you do not care what is this t, so you may also consider t equal to 0 because the statistics will not be function of time. So, when you have t equal to 0 and also say tau equal to 0, then your r tau will become u prime square, right, mean of u prime square. So, u prime into u prime at 0. So, then what does this represent? S omega at tau equal to 0 or S 0. So, S 0 will be nothing but a represented or let us say you put omega equal to 0. Okay. So, just put omega equal to 0. So, if you have S 0, what does it represent? 
to understand that let us first put what is r equal to so what is r at tau equal to 0 that will be easier for you to follow first so first let us say what is r 0 so what is r 0 minus infinity to infinity s omega d omega right and that from the definition of r is this one right therefore what we may conclude out of this that whatever we consider as energy spectrum the integral of the energy spectrum over all possible frequencies is an indicator of the rms of the velocity fluctuation right so that is how so the fourier series analysis is important because you may mathematically get this easily if you know the power spectrum energy spectrum distribution and from that directly you get a statistical behavior of the rms of the correlation now the big question is that why we are going for all these statistics why it is necessary so that question is the ultimate question for analyzing turbulence see the turbulent flow may be approached or solved by the navier stokes equation so if you, if somebody asks you a question are the navier stokes equation valid for turbulent flow very much valid but what makes it almost intractable for solving the turbulent flow problem one of the important things is a wide range of length scales and time scales so if you want to resolve such a big range of length scale and time scale by a solution strategy that is very very tedious not only that there is a whole lot of uncertainty about the sensible dependence the sensitive dependence on the initial conditions or the experimental conditions or the boundary conditions so if there is a slight perturbation the perturbation will get amplified and therefore if you exactly know what is the initial condition and boundary condition your navier stokes equation will still still give the exact solution but if you do not know then the navier stokes equation will not give the solution based on the experimental condition that you are simulating no matter whether you are resolving uh, whatever scale so in principle equations are applicable but because of the uncertainties and strongly sensitive dependence to slight perturbations from the initial and boundary conditions the outcome is not something which is acceptable uh, and that acceptability becomes more and more vulnerable as you are not able to resolve all these length scales and time scales so what is the alternative alternative is you go for a statistical description but the thing is that when you go for a statistical description we will see that the in terms of statistical behavior turbulence will be deterministic that is you may have randomly fluctuating variables but the statistical descriptions are not random they are deterministic but we will see that a problem will come that the governing equations will not be closed so this is an irony that in terms of the statistical description you have the governing equations which are sort of deterministic but they are not apparently closed on the other hand in terms of the actual variables the governing equations are perfect they are closed but it, they are not deterministically solvable so this type of dilemma is there and that is why understanding turbulence through mathematics is one of the very difficult things and it has been till now not solved and in classical physics this is considered to be the last unsolved problem in classical physics that is understanding a proper mathematical description of turbulence so whatever description of turbulence we will be having will be very very elementary just to give you a qualitative picture and that we will do in the next class thank you